scientists, it's Jessica Power with another episode of Science Today. Fred and I have a really interesting topic to cover with you today, and better yet, we're going to talk about the Kansas City Chiefs. So scientists, the last couple weeks we have talked about what is science and what does it mean to be a scientist, specifically with making observations and collecting information in science notebooks. So last week, scientists, we read a book together about how scientists use notebooks to collect their thinking, to draw pictures, to write observations, to collect data. And then they use that notebook in order to make connections and learn about the world around them. Well, today, scientists, you're going to get the opportunity to make some observations and make some hypothesis. That's right. You're going to make a hypothesis. Do you know what hypothesis is? Hypothesis. Well, a hypothesis is a guess. It's a prediction to a question. So for example, if I asked you the question, what weight will require more force for me to lift a eight pound weight or a 15 pound weight, what would you predict? Which do you think will require more force or will require more effort for me to lift? An eight pound weight or a 15 pound weight? Make your guess. Okay, scientists, we're gonna get back to that question in a little bit, but you have your prediction, right? You have your hypothesis. Some of you may have said it's gonna take more force or more effort for me to lift an eight pound weight and some of you probably said it's gonna take more force or weight or effort for me to lift a 15 pound weight. Now, whichever one you answered or predicted, why? Why did you pick that one? Why did you pick eight pounds? Why did you pick 15 pounds? Give, your second, give yourself a second to think about that. Come up with a reason, why? Why did you pick the eight pound weight requiring more force or effort for me to lift? Or why did you pick the 15 pound weight? Okay, so you've got your prediction. You just thought about why you made that prediction. Now hold on to that prediction. We're gonna come back to it. Now scientists, our topic today is about force. Not like Star Wars and may the force be with you. A different kind of force. We're gonna stay here on Earth with force. So scientists, behind us, you will see a poster has been made that says force with the definition. The definition of force is a push or pull on an object. That means I'm either pushing on it or pulling on it. Those are our two options. Now to help you out, I've got a drawing, don't laugh at my drawing, of a person pushing on a door and pulling on a door. I'm sure you've pushed or pulled on objects before. You may not have realized it, or you may not have been thinking, I'm pushing on this object right now. Or I'm pulling out this chair to sit in it. I'm done sitting in this chair, so I'm gonna push the chair back into the table. You probably don't think about that as you're doing it. So let's talk about that. So scientists, let's start with a push. There's lots of things that we push. If you ever have pushed someone on a swing, right, you've stood behind them and you've pushed them as they begin swinging, you're pushing them away from you. Or you're using force to push them. Now, have you ever noticed if you've pushed somebody on a swing before, the more you push them or the harder you push them, the higher on the swing they tend to go. Interesting. What else could you push? A car door, what about a car door? Have you ever pushed a car door closed? Like after you get out of the car? Now have you ever slammed a car door? What's the difference between pushing a car door closed and slamming a car door closed? What's the difference between those two? Yeah, when you slam a door, you push that door really, really hard, or you give the door more force. Catching on yet? Let's talk about pulling. Have you ever done tug of war? In tug of war, there's one rope, 
and there's two teams and each team is on the side each side of the rope and the object is that the teams will pull as hard as they can to try to make the other team not be able to resist and fall forward tug of war is a game of pulling it means you're doing everything you can to bring that team closer to you so scientists to keep things simple a push means we're moving something away from us a pull means we're bringing something into us now i mentioned at the beginning that we were going to talk about the chiefs today and football and seeing as though we're in kansas city it seemed like a pretty good time to talk about the chiefs so let's talk about tyreek hill are you a fan of tyreek hill everybody's a fan of tyreek hill tyreek hill is crazy fast right he gets out of the end zone so quickly but part of his position is that he has to catch the ball before he takes off and focus for that touchdown. Now, if you've ever watched closely, when football players have the ball, doesn't matter if it's the wide receiver or running back or quarterback, you'll notice that if they catch the ball or when they get the ball, they pull that ball in close to them so they can protect it. So Tyree Kill, when he catches the ball, he pulls it into his body to protect it and he takes off for the end zone. See how force is working there? He's pulling the ball in. Now in football, you also have an offensive and defensive line. And their jobs are pretty simple, although they're pretty tough on the field. The first thing is that the offensive line, those are those players that line up in a row their job is to make sure that the defensive team doesn't get to the quarterback. So the quarterback, or Patrick Mahomes in our case, can throw the ball or give the ball to one of his tight ends, wide receivers, or running backs. Now the job of an offensive lineman is when the ball is moved, when the play starts, the offensive linemen typically put their hands up and their job, and you typically see their hands go up and out. This means that they are pushing the defensive player away so that they don't get through. Just another example of pushing and pulling in football. So let's go back to our definition. A force is a push or pull on an object. Can you think of any other examples in football or soccer or basketball or swimming or tennis, any sport? Pick your favorite sport. Can you think of another example of a push and a pull in your favorite sport? Well, scientists, the Royals are also playing right now. It's still baseball season. And there's lots of push and pulls that happen in baseball. Let's talk about batting. So the batter is in the batter's box, they're lined up, and they hit the ball. Okay, imagine Salvi Perez is up to, up to bat, and he hits the ball. And he brings the bat through, and the ball takes off and goes a really, really long way. Scientists, do you think Salvi Perez just pushed or pulled that baseball with the baseball bat? Yeah, he pushed it, right? That ball traveled really, really far, and that bat pushed that ball out. Awesome. Can you think about some other examples? What about soccer? Can you think about how someone might push or pull a soccer ball? So anytime a player is running with a soccer ball, right, and they're kicking that ball forward, that's a push. Have you ever seen a soccer player stop and then roll the ball back closer to them? That's a pull. Getting the hang of it? Perfect. So when we got started, scientists, I asked you to make a prediction. I asked you, which would be more challenging or require more force for me to lift? An eight pound weight, this is an eight pound dumbbell, or a 15 pound dumbbell. So this weighs 15 pounds. And scientists, you had to make a prediction. I asked you to predict 
which is going to require more force. So am I gonna have to pull the eight pound dumbbell up more? Or am I gonna have to pull the 15 pound dumbbell up more? And scientists, you made that prediction. Can you remind me what your prediction was again? Okay, and can you tell me why you made that prediction? Awesome, let's find out. Okay, scientists, so here's how we're gonna do this. A little bit of weightlifting during our video today. So I'm gonna pull doing a bicep curl. Let's learn a fun fact. Scientists, your bicep is the muscle that runs from your elbow area up to your shoulder. So if you stick out your arm and a little bump happens, that's your bicep, okay? So I'm gonna stay here and you watch really closely. See which one's more difficult, requires more force for me to pull. This is the eight pound dumbbell. Does this look too difficult for me? No, it doesn't. Who knows, maybe I'm super strong and the 15 pound dumbbell won't be that difficult either. Okay, 15 pound dumbbell, are you ready? This one's a lot heavier. Okay. Oh. So which one required more force? The eight pound dumbbell or the 15 pound dumbbell? Yeah, that's right, the 15 pound dumbbell. This one's a lot heavier. Requires me to use more force, use a lot more muscle to pull that dumbbell up. And requires a little bit more control bringing that dumbbell down. So scientists, why do you think the 15 pound dumbbell, this one, was harder for me to use force with than the eight pound dumbbell? Why do you think? Did you say because I'm just not strong? That's not very nice, but I'll take it. Or did you say that the 15 pound dumbbell weighs more? It weighs a lot more. That's correct. So let's go back to our chart scientists. So a force is a push or pull on an object. Now before we wrap up from talking about a push or pull on an object and force, let's go back to the Chiefs. So our quarterback, Patrick Mahomes. He's pretty good, right? Yeah. Now, when Patrick gets the football, he usually takes a couple steps back and then he throws the football or tosses the football or hands the football off to one of his offensive players. Now, let's say he's throwing the ball this play, scientist, to a wide receiver. He's throwing the ball. Let's think about force. Is Patrick Mahomes pushing? or pulling that ball from his hand. When he throws his football, is he pushing or pulling that football? That's right, he's pushing it. Now, the more oomph he puts on it, or the harder he throws that football, the more force that football will have as it moves through the air. So the harder he throws, the more force he uses with the football, the farther that football's gonna go. You'll notice that when he just does a little toss off to either a running back or tight end, or even a wide receiver, when he tosses it, there's not near as much force on that ball, so it's not moving as fast as when he throws the ball down the field, where he applies more force. So scientists, this week, I want you to think about what are some things that you can push and pull around you? And if you wanna take it a step further, test those objects. Like me with my ugh, dumbbells. We just did a scientific test here. We wanted to find out which dumbbell requires more force to lift, the eight pound dumbbell or the 15 pound dumbbell. You can do little tests or investigations like this at home. 
you can find out on carpet versus hard floor. Which carpet or the hard floor requires more force to push in a chair? Or you could go outside and kick a soccer ball around. Or you could even color. Use crayons, crayons or colored pencils. How does the shading or how does the color that when you're coloring get impacted by the amount of force? Have you ever lightly shaded something where you don't use much force? And then you color something really, really hard where you're using a lot of force. You're pushing that crayon into the paper. See, force is all around us. Whenever you push or pull anything. So this week, scientists, take some time. Go out in your community or so where you live and find different objects to push and pull. Make connections, make observations. What type of objects are really easy to pull? What types of objects are really easy to push? What types of objects require more force or less force to push and pull? How does the motion or how does the movement of an object change when you push or pull at different strengths? I think, it's, I think you've got this. I think it's time for you to go find some pushes and pulls and experience force. I'll see you next week, scientists. Have an awesome day and a great week. Scientist, it's Jessica Power from Kansas City Public Schools, one of the science curriculum coordinators. Now, the last few weeks, Fred and I have read some books to you about how to be a scientist and how scientists use data to make observations and learn about different science concepts. Well, I want you to think back to a few weeks ago. A few weeks ago, we talked about adaptations and how animals have unique features or characteristics that allow them to survive in their ecosystems. We specifically took a look at penguins from the Kansas City Zoo. And we talked about how penguins had really dense feathers that helps keep them warm. We talked about the fat layer that penguins had. And we also talked about a really interesting, unique feature or adaptation that penguins have. And that was that they have little spikes on their tongue. And those little spikes are able to help the penguins to grab or hold on to prey because they eat things from the ocean like shrimp and krill. And we know that things can be slippery when wet, so a shrimp or krill could be kind of slippery. And so the spikes on the penguin's tongue allows the penguin to be able to hold on to that prey to take it to land to eat. Well, we're going to expand on that thought just a little bit today. And we're going to talk about traits. So back when we talked about adaptations, I used the word features and characteristics a lot. We're going to replace those with the word traits today. Back here on our vocab poster, I have the definition for a trait. A trait is just a characteristic of a living thing. So for us humans, eye color, skin color, hair color, height, those are traits. Those are things that we have that are unique and characteristic to us. Now there's other things that we have that are also traits. I have pierced ears. Do you have pierced ears? Those are a kind of trait. I have scars from when I played softball and got cleated by other players. Scars are a type of trait. But what's interesting is that some of the traits that we have, we get from our parents. And some traits are things that we acquire. So we're gonna take the word trait today. We're gonna break that down into two kind of traits. The first kind of trait is an inherited trait. That's a trait that is passed down from parent to offspring. So when I gave the example of eye color or hair color or skin color, those are examples of an inherited traits, meaning they come from our genetics and it's in our DNA. Now animals, different kinds of animals, they have all sorts of inherited traits. Think about dogs or cats or any type of animal with fur. Their fur and their coat, that's an inherited trait, how thick the fur is, how much maybe a dog sheds, the color of the fur, those are all inherited. Plants also have inherited traits. Things like thorns or spikes or how tall a plant gets or the color of the flowers. 
Now I know we can put flowers, we can put the stem of flowers into food coloring or dye and we can change the flower color, but the actual color of the flower when it blooms is an inherited trait. So scientists, today we're gonna to be comparing and contrasting. We're gonna be analyzing some photos of different plants and animals to compare and figure out, determine which offspring goes with which parent. Before we do that though, I wanna talk about our other kind of trait. Our second kind of trait is an acquired trait. And these are sometimes a little bit more difficult to identify or pick out from an organism. An acquired trait is a trait that plants or animals develop through interactions in their environment. So I want to go back to the word acquired. Acquired means to obtain or to get or to develop. We acquire acquired traits, meaning we're not born with these traits. A lot of times we learn these traits or we get these traits through experiences. So earlier I mentioned that I played softball. Well, when I played softball, we would wear metal cleats and sometimes those cleats can be really sharp. And so when you would slide in, there was a potential to get cleated by someone, right? Now when you get cleated by someone, that can cause a scar. Or if you fall off your bike, or if you get a paper cut, because I would hate a paper cut to cause a scar. Any type of scar is an acquired trait. You aren't born with it, but you develop it or you acquire it because of an experience with the environment, the things around you. Now things like pierced ears, tattoos, those are all types of acquired traits. They make the organism stand out, right? It's something unique, something that's specific to that organism. But it also helps to describe or it's the characteristic of that organism. Now when we talk about plants and animals, a lot of plants and animals don't necessarily have pierced ears or things like that. But we talk a lot about behaviors. Behaviors are acquired trait. So let's talk about beavers for a second. If you've ever seen a beaver, either in person or in a picture or a show, anywhere, beavers are known for their big front teeth. And those big front teeth are used for chipping out wood and breaking down branches and limbs in order to build a dam, which is their shelter. And we know that all living things need shelter in order to stay safe and survive. Now, the beaver's teeth, those are inherited. Those are an inherited trait that they, the beaver gets from its parents. Its parents got its teeth from its grandparents, right? Those big teeth are passed down from generation to generation and they're common. Now, a beaver's ability to build a dam, well, that's an acquired trait, that's a behavior. Now, the first dam that a beaver builds is not as good as the third or fifth dam that the beaver builds. But over time, it learns, it acquires the skills needed in order to survive in its environment. Different animals, especially prey in different ecosystems, like rabbits or frogs, they tend to put on more muscle the more and more they have to run from predators. So uh, the more that a rabbit has to run from a predator, the more muscle it's probably gonna have because it needs that muscle to be able to be fast while it runs and gets away. Now, predatory skills, so think like a cheetah. Cheetahs are really quiet. And they go through the savanna so that they can't be heard, right? That's a behavior. That's a predatory behavior, which means it's a way that the organism hunts, basically. So that's an acquired trait. Some cheetahs are a little bit louder as they sneak through the savanna tall grass. Some are a little bit quieter. That's acquired. So scientists, let's get into our first activity. I've got two activities, they're just simple matching activities. Since you're watching me on a, on a TV, it's a little bit more difficult to do more of an interactive activity. But what I have is I have a picture of three different cats. And I want us to take a look at those cats. Now you'll notice that the first cat has a more of a darker gray coat on it, fur. I see some darker, dark gray, black lines above its eyes. Our second cat, the first thing that stands out to me are its ears. I notice that its ears aren't super pointy, they're more rounded at the very tips. And then it looks to be more short haired, so it's not super fluffy. And I do see that it has some stripes or different coloring in it. And the third cat is just a white cat. It looks to be pretty fluffy. 
Um, it has more pointed ears. I would say that those are more pointed than the second cat. Now scientists, I have three kittens. And these three kittens go to the three cats. Our job is to determine which kitten goes to what cat. In other words, which offspring goes to the parents. Now really quick, you're probably seeing some really obvious similarities and you probably can figure out really quickly which kittens go to which cats. But what I wanna ask you is, are you determining which kittens go to which cats by their inherited traits or their acquired traits? Are you observing the kittens and the cats based on those traits that are passed down from parent to offspring? Or are you making observations based on those acquired traits, things that they get from their environment? Which one are you using? If you said inherited traits, that's right. We can't really observe in a still, still picture what the behavior of the cats are, or what scars the cats might have, or how quickly they run away when they're scared or trying to get away from something. But we can use the inherited traits to determine which kitten or offspring goes with which parent cat. So let's take a look. My first kitten over here, I notice its ears are a little bit rounded at the top. I notice it's got these two lines above the eyes right there. It's got a little bit different coloring. There's some lighter fur and some darker fur. Which parent do you think this goes to? If you said this little kitten goes to this parent, that's right. Now let's take a look at our second kitten. Our second, it kinda looks like a cotton ball a little bit, doesn't it? Our second kitten is covered in white fluffy fur. Its ears are a little bit more pointed. Which cat do you think this kitten goes to? Absolutely. This one goes down here. And that leaves our gray kitten with the gray parent cat. Now you'll notice some similar characteristics here. You'll notice that this cat has those darker lines up at the top, just like the dark gray cat over here has the darker lines. But as we made these similarities and compared the three kittens and the three cats to determine the offspring to the parent, we use those inherited traits. Now usually animals are pretty easy to determine parents and offspring, to identify which traits or which characteristics came from the parent and ended up in the offspring. For example, both of my parents have blue eyes. Guess what? I have blue eyes. Now, both of my parents have similar hair colors. My dad's is a little bit darker and my mom's is a little bit lighter. But guess what? My hair is a lightish, blonde, lightish brown blonde, normally. This is not real. <laughs> now, animals, like I said, are pretty easy to determine parents and offspring based on characteristics. It's easy to see the physical characteristics or physical traits that are similar between a parent and an offspring. It was easy for us to determine, of the three different cats, which one was the offspring to the parent. All living things, plants and animals, have traits. And those traits are either inherited, so they're passed down from grandparent to parent to offspring, or they're acquired, which means that they develop through interactions within the environment. Let's go back to our penguins really quick. Now our penguins, they're not the top of the food chain as we talked about a few weeks ago. So one of the acquired traits that our penguins have is the ability to swim quickly. The faster they can swim away from predators, the safer they're gonna be. Our inherited traits, we talked about those, um, those prickly tongues, right? They have those sharp spikes that are able to hold on to the prey. They have those dense feather coats that keep them warm in their ecosystem. So scientists, if you get a chance this week, go take some observations. Go out and look at some plants, see how they behave, especially since we're kind of at the change of seasons. You can start to see how some of those summer plants are gonna start to behave a little bit differently now that it gets colder. And go take a look at some animals. Be careful not to get too close. You never know what a wild animal will do. But you can observe what the behaviors of that wild animal are 
Or if there's lots of those one type of animal, like a squirrel or a bird in an area, you can make observations and determine what traits that you see, physical traits, are common amongst all the different types of that bird, all the different birds of that type, and you can figure out what's an inherited trait versus maybe the behavior or a physical feature that you may see that may be different between one of the group. So take a look this, this week, scientists. Make some observations, take some notes, and see what you can find. Have a great day and a great rest of the week. We'll see you next week. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's Dr. Jones again, and I'm talking to my middle school students. Now, in past weeks, we've been talking about non-living entities, things that are abiotic, not alive. But today, we're going to be talking about living entities by going over the characteristics of life. Now, when we look at living things, not all things that have characteristics that resemble life are alive. Here's what I'm saying. There are some things that may have organization, that may require energy, but are still not considered to be living entities or living things. If you look at this list, all living things possess all seven of these characteristics. And we're going to go over them one at a time today. So let's start with the first one, organization. Now, when we're talking about organization, we're talking about the fact that all living things are composed of cells. Cells are the smallest unit of life. If you are smaller than a cell, technically, you're not alive. So, here's what I mean. Let's look at these different entities, okay? Take a moment and tell me which ones are alive, biotic, and which ones are not alive, abiotic. Now, let's start with the ones that are very easy. A leopard. Everybody knows a leopard is alive. These are pebbles. Everyone knows that pebbles are not alive. But let's talk about these others. This is a fern. All plants are living things because no matter what type of plant it is, it, they all are composed of cells. If we look at this, this is an earthworm. Earthworms also are living things because they are composed of cells. Now, this is an amoeba. An amoeba technically is an organism that is just one cell big. But because it has one cell, it's still considered to be a living thing. Now, this is a virus. Viral particles are actually smaller than cells. And viral particles only share some of the characteristics of living things, not all. So a virus would not be considered a living thing. A virus is abiotic. Next, adaptation. Now, the thing about adaptation is that it's not being accustomed to an environment. For example, if it's cold outside, I'll put on a coat. I didn't adapt to the cold. I just compensated for it. However, adaptation is when an organism, over time, is able to survive in an environment that has changed over time. So here's the question. Why don't individuals adapt to their environment? Here's why. As I said, adaptation is a change in the environment. Environmental changes take a long time to occur. If you think about it, you just don't go from grass to a small tree to a very large oak in a matter of days. It takes years. And if you think about organisms, you, in the lifespan of a great oak, would have multiple generations of giraffe. So you may say, well then, how did their necks get this height? Well, as you know, when the environment changes. Certain animals can survive because they're made or they are designed for that change and other animals won't survive because they're not made 
are designed for that change. Those that are not able to survive die off. Those that are reproduced in their offspring share the same characteristics. So in this case, over time, you will find that giraffes with longer necks tended to live, which means they will pass those genes on to their offspring. Okay? Response to environment. Now, here's the thing. Living things will make a physical change either in place or in the chemistry based on the environmental change. I'll make it even clearer. If you take your hand and put it on a hot stove, you will pull it back without even trying because that's your body's reaction to the fact that you're burning your hand. You'll find that there are more subtle ways of doing this. I'll give you an example. If you look at a plant, plants always turn in the direction of light. As long as you have a living plant, it will always face the light. However, if you have a dead plant, you can put it in all the sunlight you want to. It will not grow because it is no longer a living entity. Okay? Regulation. Now, when we're talking about regulation, we're not talking about control as much as being able to maintain. Here's what I mean. If you look at the human body, if you become too hot, what do you do to try to cool off? You sweat. If you're too cold, what do you do to try to create some kind of heat? You'll shiver. These are types of responses to the environment that allow you to regulate your temperature. When an organism dies, or if an organism or an entity cannot make a change internally to compensate for the external change, it is not a living thing. Now, I know some of you are thinking about like reptiles. For example, they don't sweat, but they will change their location. One reason why alligators sun is because they need the heat to help them digest their food. One reason that bears hibernate is because without the amount of food available, they can't maintain their body systems. So there's a lot of ways organisms, living organisms, compensate for regulating our homeostasis, the, the system. Okay? Next, energy processing. There's two main types of energy processing reactions or mechanisms in living things. You will either go through photosynthesis, where you use light to create energy, in the form of like sugars, or you'll go through cellular respiration, where you take a sugar and convert that into something called an ATP. Think of ATP like gas for a car. It allows it to go. The more ATPs you have, the more energy you have, which is one reason why if you're an athlete, the day before a game, you definitely want a car upload. That way you'll have enough energy to sustain you throughout the tournament or the game. Now, batteries generate their energy, but here's the key. Living things must get their energy from the environment. A battery makes its energy because of a chemical reaction that occurs inside a battery. However, if the lion does not eat its prey, it will die. It will not get the energy that it needs. Where does the prey get the energy from? The plant. Where do the plants get the energy from? The sun. So you see how this works? Growth and development. Now, here's the thing about growth and development. Everybody can understand growth as getting bigger, but growth also means that you're getting uh, more number or increasing in number. Development deals with going from like an organism that is very simple or in its you know, childlike state to an organism that is larger, adult-like state. So if we're looking at this, these bacteria are growing. 
But if you look at a puppy compared to an adult dog, there is some development that occurs. It just doesn't get larger. There are other things that occur that make the puppy different from the adult dog. Reproduction. Reproduction occurs in many different ways. But here's the thing. Living organisms copy their own DNA to bring about new entities. So here's what we're saying. If you look at a blue whale, it's very easy to understand. Ah, one blue whale, male, one blue whale, female, come together, blue whale baby. Very simple. But there are other ways in which living organisms can make copies of themselves by copying their DNA. For example, there's something called asexual reproduction. Think of asexual reproduction as the copying machine of living organisms. For example, if you take a starfish or a sea star and cut it, you will actually be able to grow an additional sea star just from that cut piece. If you look at hydra, and, and these are like microscopic organisms, okay? They're single cell. They go through a process of called budding, where literally you'll have like a small hydra growing out the side of a larger one. That small hydra will continue to grow and grow and grow until it's the same size as the parent hydra it came from. And then with bacteria, a process called binary fission. Again, just think of it as a biologic copy machine. Now, not all things that make copies are alive. For example, bacteria make copies of viruses. The bacteria is alive, but the virus is not. And here's why. The way that a virus makes copies of itself is by taking its DNA and putting it into a bacteria. It would be like if I was going to the copy machine and my colleague said, hey, could you like copy these for me? I'll put them in with my sheets and they didn't make the copies. I made the copies, okay? Same thing. The viruses aren't making copies of themselves. The bacteria are making copies of the virus. So, with all this being said, I just wanted to point out, again, there are seven criteria of all living things. All living things do all seven of that criteria. If you don't do all seven, you're not a living thing. I hope this makes the abiotic and biotic discussion very clear for you guys. Have a great week and I'll see you next week. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Dr. Jones, and I'm speaking to my high school students. Now, the last time I saw you, we were talking about heredity and genetics. We're going to pick up that conversation this morning. Now, as you remember from before, our concept or our talk dealt specifically with asexual and sexual reproduction. Now, we're going to move on to what's called a supporting standard. Think of a supporting standard as the prequel to the sequel. When you look at this, we're now going to talk about, well, what brings about this asexual and sexual reproduction? Well, it's all in DNA. And so in this class, during this session, we're going to be talking about how DNA is passed from the parents to the offspring. Okay? Now, again, if we go back to Mendelian genetics, you know, Mendel, the monk, didn't have any kids, a lot of plants, a lot of time. One of the things that we were able to talk about are dominant and recessive genes. Now, understand, Mendel didn't know anything about genes. All he knew is that if he paired certain plants together, he would get a predictable outcome based on the plants that he started out with. So when we're looking at this, first of all, understand that anytime you have a capital letter, that's a dominant trait. Think of a dominant trait as that dominant friend. Every time they're in the room, they demand the room. They demand the conversation. No one else gets to talk. 
think of the little b as recessive traits or those friends that when no one else is around they just start gabbing and gabbing and gabbing now one other thing i want to bring up is homogeneous heterogeneous or homozygous and heterozygous when we talk about homozygous we're just saying that both alleles or both genes are the same big b big b two dominant people Little b, little b, two recessive people. A heterozygous would be someone where, or would be uh, an individual that has a dominant gene and a recessive gene. Big dog, little dog. Okay? So, when you're looking at a Punnett square, last thing, the way that you differentiate the mother or tell the difference between the mom and the dad, normally, mom's up top, dad's on the side. Now, Let's talk about why things are separated in this way. Well, if you think about asexual reproduction, mitosis, we start off with 2N, 46 chromosomes. You end up with cells that are 2N, 46 chromosomes. However, when we start talking about sexual reproduction, where you have two individuals, now you have to half in the amount of chromosomes. Here's what I mean. Think of it this way. You start off with a cell, an individual, that has 46 chromosomes. There's no way that your mom and your dad could give you 46 chromosomes from both of them. Then you'd have like 92. You'd be, you know, freaking nature. However, if you look at what happens in meiosis, you will find that in the process, you half it or you decrease the number of chromosomes. It would be like taking a deck of cards, separating your reds from your blacks, or separating the diamonds and the hearts from the spades and the clubs, then shuffling them all up. What you find is that depending on if you're dealing from the hand with the spades and the clubs, or if you're dealing from the hand with the hearts and the diamonds, you'll get an assortment, but just of those particular suits, okay? When you're looking at egg and sperm, as I said, you start off with the father. He has 46 chromosomes, but each of his sperm cells only have 23. If you look at the mother, again, 46 chromosomes in the mother, but her ovum or egg only has 23. This process is called spermatogenesis. This process is called oogenesis. Yeah, gotta love the word. Oh, oh, Genesis. Yeah. So, looking back at our Punnett square, here's what we're saying. This would be one ovum, one egg from the mother that has a dominant gene. This would be another egg from the mother with a recessive gene. This would be one sperm cell from the father, dominant gene. This is another sperm cell from the father. But this one has a recessive gene. So you can pair this sperm with this egg, get you. This sperm with this egg, get this individual. This sperm with this egg. And then this two sperm and egg. Okay? Now, last thing before we really get into the math of science. You find that when you look at a Punnett square, it gives you the ratio or the probability of having a particular offspring. Here's what I mean. If you look at this one, okay, our big B, little b scenario, you will find that three of the four squares actually have a dominant or a large B, which means you have three-fourths of a chance of having this dominant trait. Okay? Now, Notice, you only have one out of the four that have two recessive. Meaning, you only have one-fourth of a chance of having the recessive trait. Now, last thing. I told you, you have homozygous, both are the same. Heterozygous, both different. So if you're looking at this, you have one out of four chance of being homozygous dominant one out of four chances being 
a homozygous recessive, and then you have two out of four or 50% chance of being a heterozygous. Okay? This is another example, and again, another trait, another gene. So, you could possibly be homozygous recessive for one gene, but you could pee, be uh, dominant for the other. Okay? Now, let's get into the math. Okay? Oh, and by the way, this process, almost for guys, is called independent assortment. Here's what that means. When you take a deck of cards and you shuffle them up and you start dealing them out, the cards that you deal have no bearing on the next card that you pick, except for the fact that you're taking that out of the pile. In independent assortment, we're saying, let's assume that you're dealing out cards, but for every spade or for every ace you dealt out, another one appeared in the deck. So at that point, it doesn't matter how many aces I deal out, I'll always have more aces. So one of the things that sometimes people get confused with is they use a deck of cards to try to describe independent assortment, but it's not quite right. Because there's only four aces in the deck. If I deal out four aces, I can't deal out a fifth one. But that is not how the body works. Okay? All right. So, let's get to the math calculations of science, okay? And to do this, first of all, I'm going to need a white screen. And next, I'm going to need my trusty die. Now, here's the deal. If you're looking at these, you'll find that I have capital A's, lowercase a's, capital B's, lowercase b's, capital C's, and lowercase c's. Now, I have the same number of capital A's as lowercase a's. So, if I were to write this out, think of it as a parent that would look like this. Capital A, let me make that a little thicker. Hold on one second. capital A, lowercase a. Okay? So, here we go. Let's assume that's your mom, Boop. and here's your dad. Boop. Now, we know from our Punnett square that I broke this up, egg and sperm, I should have, just like before, A one out of four chance of getting capital A, capital A. A two out of four chance of getting capital A, lowercase a. And a one out of four chance getting little a, little a. So, let's try this out. First, I'm going to roll for your mom. Then, I'm going to roll for your dad. Okay, and let's pick another color just so that we can show the offspring. All right, here we go. First one, capital A, lowercase a. Okay, let's try it again. Capital A, this one actually fell, but lowercase a again. Let's try it one more time. Capital A. Lowercase a. So you see, if we keep on doing this, capital A, capital A, you will find that for the most part, you will get this. The reason? You have more are higher chance of getting a capital A and a lowercase a than getting 
two capital A's. Okay? Now, if we use two die, here's how it changes the scenario. Watch. Gotta love it. Got to love this. Alright. So, if you have two, now you have to look at these as being independent. Here's what I mean. I'm going to do this quickly. You could have a capital A. You could have a capital B. You could have a capital A and a little b. You could have a little a, a capital B, and then you could have a little a, a little b. So if you do this one, technically it would be a 4 by 4, or it would be 16 different options. One more. But if we had this, now, different color, you would have capital A, capital B, capital C, capital A, capital B, lowercase c, capital A, lowercase b, capital C, capital A, lowercase b, lowercase c, lowercase a, capital B, capital C, lowercase a, lowercase b, capital C, and finally, lowercase a, lowercase b, and lowercase c. So in this scenario, you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Did I get all the possible combinations? Yep, yep. Yep, yep. Yep, yep. Yep, yep. Seven times seven, 49. Now, I know just because of who I am, I should get 64. I think I may have forgotten something. You could probably, if you were here, help me out. But the idea is that if you look at the outcome of the dead, and you multiply that by the outcome of the mom, you could find the probability of the offspring. Okay? Now, the next time I see you, we will move forward from a normal monogenetic to more of a polygenetic. Because here's the thing. If you have a 6-5 dad and a 6 or a 5-2 let me rephrase that. 6'5 dad, a 5'2 mom. You're not going to be 6'5 or 5'2. Somewhere in the middle. I hope you have a great day. I'll see you next week.